Hey y'all, I'm Afton Geek here, and welcome back to the only YouTube channel where the G stands for Gods from the Spaces Beyond Reality. What's this, another podcast episode so soon? Yeah, well, I wanted to make sure my time to listen through all of Malevolent was actually worth it in some way, so here we are. Yes, today we're talking about the all Harlan Guthrie show, Malevolent. I say that half in jest, but honestly, he's got an insane vocal range. Anyways, this video is going to be half exploration of the world Malevolent exists in, half plot synopsis, and half personal reaction. If the math on that is making your head hurt, I'd recommend turning away now, because this is going to get all sorts of weird. Oh, and obviously, spoiler warning for all of Malevolent up to the most recent episode, part 30. Before we talk about the silly little mystery podcast that took over my Twitter timeline, though, let's talk about your future. Looking into it, I see... Hmm, is that a button? Green. Maybe no. Red. I get the feeling that if you press the button, you'll be more likely to see my videos, and we'll be helping support the channel. Oh, the, uh, the subscribe button? Well, I hope that the choice is obvious. Alright, I should probably establish what Malevolent even is. As you may have gathered, Malevolent is a fusion of Lovecraftian horror and mystery, all bottled up in the form of a Choices Matter podcast. The choices part might seem strange at first, but the whole premise is that members of the podcast Patreon are able to control the narrative by making major decisions for the characters. While this can lead to some disjointed dialogue and convoluted storytelling, it hasn't led them too far astray in what I've listened to. Oh, and for what it matters, Malevolent has now been acquired by Rusty Quill, the same company that brought us the Magnus Archives, which I am very familiar with. Originally, this is where I was going to explain the whole plot of Malevolent, but it ended up being way too dense, so instead, here's the one paragraph version. Trust me, this is for the better. The last one took up multiple pages and I didn't even get past season 2. If there's enough support, I might do a TMA style short summary and rating of each episode in the future. Anyways, Arthur Lester is a private eye who wakes up to find his vision gone, his memory wiped, and what he presumes to be his business partner dead on the floor. Fortunately for his navigational skills, it appears that a mysterious entity, which later claims the name John Doe, has taken control of his eyes and now acts as a voice within his head. Arthur and John then begin chasing a trail, which starts with the book John seems to have been summoned from, and leads through a string of disappearing girls to a mysterious cult. Along the way, John gains a great amount of humanity, while Arthur gains a whole new slew of wounds, including almost dying. The two get transported to the dreamlands by this cult, and spend their time there half-tracking, half-fleeing from a mysterious entity known as the King in Yellow. Oh, uh, John's actually a fragment of the King in Yellow? Keep that in mind, cause that's important for later. They navigate through this strange world, wandering through forests, deserts, caves, a city slaughtered by a mysterious figure called Cain, before eventually finding what could have been a way home. Unfortunately for them, the dynamic duo gets caught by the king in yellow, at which point Arthur slices his throat open to prevent the king from getting John back, but it doesn't work, and Arthur is sent hurtling back to Earth on the brink of life. In order to save himself, Arthur makes a deal with Cain and gets a fragment of the king back, but not John, which he nicknames Yellow, in exchange for his survival. For those keeping track at home, this is the second time that Arthur sustains grievous injuries that almost kill him. It will not be the last. Arthur and Yellow find themselves in a town with closed-down mines haunted by an invisible presence. It turns out that the family running the mines are actually evil, shocker, and they throw Arthur down into the mines to face the beast. Fortunately for him, he manages to get John back in this moment, so the old chums navigate the darkness, eventually killing a member of the family and freeing trapped beings. Scratch that, two members of the family, since the invisible monstrosity is Larson, the main family guy's child. Oh, the monster also almost kills Arthur somewhere in there, 
and we learn that John has his own deal with Kane, so that's a new, unresolved as of now plotline, and time number three that the you really shouldn't have survived this buddy Count Arthur's accruing. Now we get to the latest episodes, where Arthur manages to escape from a hitman on a speeding train and successfully rent an apartment in New York City. I'll let you decide which is scarier. Alright, that's the synopsis. Every time I describe this story, I feel like I'm still missing something. This time, for instance, I didn't even mention how John seems to slowly gain more parts of Arthur's body in moments of intense stress, which leads Arthur to worry that he will eventually be reduced to nothing or sent off to a nightmare afterlife called the Dark World, or the entire emotional throughline of Arthur's dead kid Faro, a music box, and her song, which is also the show's theme song, or that Cain might be Jesus Christ himself. I think this is about as well as I can do with a reasonable amount of time. This show is really dense, so I don't know. Just go listen to it. In order for us to understand the world Malevolent operates in, we have to understand the mythos of H.P. Lovecraft, and it's about at this point that I have to address the elephant that barges into the room when old Howard Phillips' name gets brought up. H.P. Lovecraft, you see, was, even by his times' his standards, terribly, horribly, unflinchingly racist. In fact, it seems like Lovecraft hated just about everything and everybody who wasn't him. As a result, while I genuinely enjoy a lot of his work and find it to be very effective cosmic horror, I need to make it very clear that I do not condone nor agree with any of his views on race, class, or Really, anything that doesn't involve tentacles and too many eyes. Oh, and the ocean, because that shit is terrifying. Everybody clear on that? The comments aren't going to turn into a battleground because I mentioned his name? Perfect. The first thing we have to establish about the world of Malevolent is that it's not solitary, which is why I have that pesky S in the title. According to John, there are a number of realities and planes beyond the one in which Arthur Lester operates, all existing across different times and different states. While Arthur's world is set in 1934, for example, there are some set in the far future, and others which seems to be outside of time entirely. One such world is an afterlife-like domain known as the Dark World. According to John in the first episode, he was originally from another world before dying and being sent to a world of shadows. It is an inky abyss filled with all of the garbage left behind by other worlds, although whether we can even trust its existence given our newer information about the King of Yellow is unclear. In fact, the change in how John was bound to the book seems to indicate that it may have been a falsehood, an incorrect memory, or even intentional points of deceit. Still, I'm going to include it, if for no other reason than to be completely comprehensive. Another of these strange worlds is the Dreamlands, which appear to be a dimension controlled mostly by the King in Yellow, where logic and reasoning no longer apply. It's filled with a number of abominations and peculiar locations, many of which I'll get into later, but it certainly is worth putting a pin in. Zooming in a bit, some of the smaller locations are worth mentioning. The first few episodes take place in Arkham City, where Arthur's private investigative services are centered. To those of you who are familiar with Lovecraft Country, you'll immediately recognize the city as Arkham, Massachusetts, a common setting for his stories, including The Picture in the House, Herbert West, Reanimator, and The Dunwich Horror. For you DC fans, this is where the iconic Arkham Asylum gets its name from, which is actually quite funny because there's an Arkham Sanitarium mentioned in the thing on the doorstep, but that's so beyond relevant that I actually forgot what the point of this sentence is. One of the most notable features of Arkham is, of course, the very prestigious, and equally fictional, Miskatonic University. In particular, its library is renowned for its quantity of books on the esoteric and occult, including perhaps the most famous volume in all of Lovecraft's work, The Complete Necronomicon. 
However, it also includes lesser known pieces, such as the cult describing Unausprechlichen Kulten and the fragmentary, but much easier to say, Book of Avon. The library makes an appearance in the second episode of Malevolent, with Arthur and John paying it a visit to learn more about a strange cult worshipping a powerful entity. While there, they encounter Dr. Henry Armitage, who is the chief librarian at Miskatonic University. Aside from being old chums with Arthur from a City Hall fundraiser, Armitage makes an appearance in the Dunwich Horror as a part of the crew that confronted the short story's antagonist? I think? It's a weird story. Anyways, the book that they read from is a little harder to pin down, but I think it might actually be the Necronomicon itself. Firstly, the physical description of the book isn't a whole lot to go off of, but the choice to have the binding be cracked, much like the leather commonly ascribed to the Book of the Dead, and the choice to have sand damage on the book fits well with the established lore of the Arabic volume. Also, the passage we get from the book reads as such. Shub Nigrath, praise and abundance to the black goat of the woods. Aya, Shub Nigrath, Aya, Shub Nigrath, the black goat of the woods with a thousand young. She is lord of the wood and mother to us. This is taken almost line for line from The Whisper in Darkness, which itself is drawing from the first text to reference Shub Nigrath in any capacity, the Dunwich Horror. Where do we see that first appearance take place? Well, the exclamation of Ya Shub Nigurath is one of the few passages we ever get out of the Necronomicon. It's not enough evidence to totally sell me, but given that we have a complete copy existing in the library at some point, and that it's only been six years since the incident with the Dunwich Horror, it seems pretty reasonable that this could be the same book. There are a couple of locations at least worth mentioning in the regular world before we get to the weird stuff, so I'll be sure to get through those fast. Back in Arkham, the first episode features a visit to a bookstore called Junior DeWitt Ackerman, where John's book is originally from. I scoured high and low, and as far as I can tell, this is a unique creation of Harlan Guthrie. It's a small bookstore, and the location does check out with the maps I looked at, so uh, good job on your homework, Harlan. 58 Pelican Lane is definitely harder to find. First off, according to Lovecraft's map, there is no Pelican Lane in Arkham? Hell, none of the roads are labeled as lanes, so the closest you get is either Peabody Street or Pickman Avenue. I even checked out real places within Massachusetts. There's a Pelican Lane in Falmouth, although it is admittedly not even in the right part of Massachusetts. Oh. And did I mention that there's not even a 58 on it? So, yeah, another invention of Mr. Guthrie. The next major location John and Arthur run to is the Stansick Mansion, which is once again not based in Lovecraft's work. However, Stansick is an interesting choice of name. You see, Stansick was the name of one of the most iconic and influential jesters in history. If you've ever seen the painting of the sad clown in red, that's him. While there is some debate on whether or not he existed, his significance to Polish culture and history makes me wonder if there might be more to this connection than meets the eye. The mansion isn't really worth mentioning, although there's a crow typewriter in the basement, so that's... something. After the mansion, we get to Harper's Hill, a small town containing a couple of locales. As you may have expected, there is not a Harper's Hill in Massachusetts. Interestingly, the wiki page for this location has a map included, but I can't seem to find where it originates from. I'm not going to put it up on screen, in case it's leaked Patreon material, and there's nothing new on it we didn't already know from the podcast. I'll go through the houses first, since they're quick and easy. Both Kellen's home, with its weird head in a cage, and Amanda's home, where she was killed, are within the bounds of Harper's Hill. There's also a hospital, and the aforementioned Lake Crawford, at the center of which is an island and a graveyard. Oh, also, there's definitely something malevolent living in the lake. You know I had to make that joke at least once. North of Harper's Hill is Leary, a boring coastal town home to a rundown hotel and a cult of the Pallid Mask, devoted to the mysterious King in Yellow. 
Beneath the town is a vast sleeping city, filled with the corpses of those who dreamed too big and now ruled by the cult of the Pallid Mask. It's from the amphitheater in the center of the city that Arthur and John are transported to a plane of reality much more hostile than their familiar world, the Dreamlands. Remember when I said we'd get back to those? This is the later I was talking about. The Dreamlands seem to be a place where objects and people can phase into, so some of the strange things we see will be quite familiar. Keep those in mind for later. Oh, also, since it's worth mentioning, the Dreamlands are a location from Lovecraft's dream cycle of short stories. It's pretty similar to what we see in Malevolent, down to the presence of a great structure on a mountain. So, good job with that one, Mr. Guthrie. The first piece of the Dreamlands Arthur and John encounter is the deceptively small wandering forest. Moving along with the individuals inside of it, the trees spring up in front of them to create the illusion of a vast woodland. Arthur and John only manage to escape the woods by sacrificing a finger to it. Without the forest, there is only the immense emptiness of the desert, which includes canyons and remnants of other worlds, like an old apartment or a stranded ship. Within the desert reside a few different beings, most of whom live in fear of the frequent cutting sandstorms. The major exception is the trio of knights, who appear only as rags without the pale mask, and follow Arthur and John around in the desert. There is the cave, filled with a moss that lures you in and mentally traps you there, and a great mountain in the distance filled with caves and creatures. Within these caves is an area known as the Prison Pits, where John and Arthur spend three months, trapped and starving. Thanks to the aid of a cannon named Lorik, I know those words mean nothing to you, it'll make more sense when I explain the denizens of the Dreamlands, Arthur and John find their way to the 10,000 Steps, which are much easier to climb than expected, and the city high above them. Unfortunately for the dynamic duo, the residents of the city have been massacred by Cain by the time that they get there, so we don't get much sense of how it operated, but they do get a chance to move on to the King in Yellow's throne, and from there, out of the Dreamlands. Finally. Who would have thought that the place outside of reality would be one of the easiest parts to explain? Arthur finds himself sans John in Addison, a settlement that might generously be called a town built around the Larson Mining Company's old and now closed down coal mine. There is also a map of Addison on the wiki, which I won't be sharing for the same reasons as the map of Harper Hill, but it does indicate that there aren't very many buildings at all in the area. It also refers to the residence as somewhat zoomorphic, which, given that we know about the origins of the invisible monster in the coal mine, it's somewhat alarming. Oh, and there's an invisible monster in the coal mine. You know, in case you missed that part. The town first emerged in 1873 as a mining town, but sometime after 1916, the coal mines began to run dry and were subsequently boarded up. By the time Arthur arrives, the town is run down and forgotten, barely a footnote in history, and inhabited mostly by the Larson family, who live on the expansive Larson estate, from which the forgotten mines can be accessed. The mountain on which the town is built, Mount Husak, is also sort of implied to not be of this world. That felt significant, but I have no idea where to put it. Oh, and for the sake of prosperity, I searched to see if Addison, Massachusetts, Mount Husak, or any associated individual existed in real life or in Lovecraft's writing, and didn't come back entirely empty-handed. Obviously, the town of Addison is not real, and it doesn't appear in Lovecraft's writing, but the mountain it's built on? Well, there's no Mount Husak, but there is Husak Mountain Range in western Massachusetts, making up part of the greater Appalachia mountain chain. Husak itself is an Algonquian word meaning place of stones, and running through the heart of these stony mountains is the Husak Tunnel, a massive railroad tunnel just shy of five miles long that caused 135 deaths in its construction alone. Not particularly relevant to the story, but I think the presence of a real parallel is interesting. As for the Larson family, I didn't find much, aside from a popular eldritch horror artist named Abigail Larson and a woman named Ella Larson Nelson, who wrote several letters to old Howard Phillips. Still, it's more than I've found for some of this stuff. 
We are almost done with locations, I promise. But first, East 83rd Street in New York. East 83rd Street is obviously a real street in New York City, but I went through the whole thing on Google Maps, and while there was a burger joint and a national guitar museum, there is not a Jay Scherz's whole grocer. Oh, and obviously, Grand Central Station and Tudor City are real. At least, the last time I checked. I do want to clarify this right now, because this seems like a good break between locations and characters, that all of this is just fun nonsense. This is not meant as a takedown of Harlan Guthrie, because he's adding things and being creative. I actually applaud him for finding creative ways to combine what really exists, what's already been made, and what he's created into something new. If it sounds at any point in this video like I'm being harsh, it's just because it's one in the morning, or, in other words, too goddamn late to be recording this. I love this series. I think it's really impressive what it's done. This is just the nature of trying to explain the world something operates in. We good? Good. Good god, we've still got to do characters. Alright, let's start with our main character, Arthur Lester. Starting with the name, Arthur is a very British name that we aren't totally sure of the origins of, but was definitely popularized by the King Arthur of English myth. Leicester, meanwhile, is equally British and means a fortified place for its English origins and Latin origins, which makes sense, because what good is a king without a castle? The name Arthur appears in Lovecraft's work in the story called Facts Concerning the Late Arthur German and His Family, which is about the titular character, discovering that he is, in fact, the result of interbreeding between an ape goddess and a person. Obviously, he then does the logical thing. Scream, douse himself in oil, and start the human bonfire. This clearly doesn't connect particularly strongly to Arthur's story, unless it's revealed that he has a great-great-great-grandfather who explored the Congo, at which point we might need to start worrying. However, it is interesting to note that the story's protagonist is English, which is just enough of a point to bring up. As far as I can tell, the name Lester isn't significant in his writing. What is significant is his job. In Lovecraftian horror, the private investigator or detective protagonist is right up there with the detached scholar protagonist as one of the most popular choices, so it makes sense that Malevolent would follow suit here. Of course, he only has this job because of the tragic passing of his wife Bella and his daughter Faro, but, you know, that's not that important. Before I move on, this is too funny not to mention which is Arthur's injury section on the wiki, looks like this. As I've said many times before, this man is terrible at not almost dying. It's at this point that I'm going to not so inconspicuously skip over John and do some rapid fire minor characters. There's Peter Parker Yang, Arthur's business partner who he probably killed, Eddie, the maintenance man for Arthur's building that the pair kill for attacking them, Armitage, who I already mentioned as the well-known head librarian of Miskatonic University, a crazy magic old lady in the road, a child maybe named Eric Stancic, a wraith that tries to steal said child, Kellen Holman, a dangerous individual who wears a gas mask and talks to a decapitated head, but who John and Arthur do manage to kill, Lily, a kind nurse at the hospital, Christopher Ryan Evans, who got blamed for Amanda Cummings' death, Barnes, the police officer at Harper's Hill, Martin, the gun shop clerk, the lighthouse keeper who kept the island safe, and the widow, a being which keeps the island unsafe, former lighthouse keeper Antoine, Colin Burkhart, and Mitchell Caldwell who were sent to arrest Arthur and wind up very dead on an abandoned rust bucket of a boat, cultists Gilbert Holt and Doug Churchman, Arkham Psychiatric Hospital physician Jeffrey Orrit who treated Kellen, a traitor resident of the Dreamlands, Lorik the Canna, Lily the Bupoth, not to be confused with Lily the Human, an unlucky, now quite headless, emaciated rafter-living individual in the mines, Mr. Collins, also known as the Butcher, who tries butchering John, and Marie, what is probably Harlan's most impressive voice yet, and the thing living in one of her rooms. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of characters. 
You may have noticed that I left a few characters out of that speed round, and those are the characters that I thought deserved a little more time. First of all, let's talk about the people connected to the missing girls cases and the greater mystery at play, starting with Roland Cummings. Roland Cummings was the detective working out of Arthur's office before him, and actually plays a major role in some of Invictus Stream's other projects, specifically Call of Cthulhu Game 1, where it's confirmed that he has, in fact, been killed. The context of these stories explains a whole lot of the mystery surrounding the merry band of fools who came before, so I'll probably be referencing it quite a bit here. Roland's daughter Amanda was kidnapped by a cult while his wife was murdered. Elijah Strong, the man leasing out Arthur's office, indicates that he left the city in a hurry shortly after that. Said daughter, Amanda Cummings, who sometimes went by her middle name Sarah, appears to have been involved in the binding of John to the book, though it also appears that that may have been by accident. After her father's decision to move to the frozen maple-covered lands of the north and her mother's other preoccupations were made clear to Amanda, she moved out to Harper's Hill, spending a fair deal of time on the island until being killed by an individual under the influence of the King in Yellow. Amanda also wrote several letters to what we now know was Anastancic. If that name seems familiar, then you probably recognize her relationship to the mysterious child and the wraith, which was probably her mother. The third missing girl found in connection to 58 Pelican Lane was Emily McFarland, who was found significantly less alive than Anna and Amanda. Specifically, Emily ended up opening John's book, but was deemed to be too difficult to manipulate and as a result was torn to ribbons. Her father, Henry McFarland, who was one of the four player characters of Call of Cthulhu, Game 1, was descended from one of the three soldiers and killed Frank Underhill's wife under command of Roland Cummings. Who's Frank Underhill, you ask? Well, aside from being another player character in Call of Cthulhu, Game 1, He's the resident of the entire apartment I mentioned getting transported to the Dreamlands, and wound up wandering the Dreamlands in search of an escape, before eventually succumbing to the elements in the temple to the King in Yellow. Would you believe me if I told you that this is the least complicated version of this part of the script I've tried writing? Well, now that that nonsense is finished, let's skip ahead to the Larson family, because they're pretty boring and easy to explain. Andrew Larson, or more accurately, Wallace Larson, is the figurehead of the family, and has been for over a century. After losing his family, Wallace joined the Cult of the Fallen Star in an effort to bring them back, and while it does seem to have netted him some sweet benefits, it doesn't seem to have accomplished the goals he really wanted. Wallace did have a new son, named Jack Larson, who replaced the two sons he lost and one daughter he sacrificed to form the town named after her. Of course, this goat-like monstrosity, nicknamed Uncle, was eventually killed by Arthur, but I'm sure that won't be significant at all to the plot going forwards. Oh, there is one more person in the Larson lineage worth mentioning, although the word person might be a bit of a stretch. Yep, it's Larson's thoroughly inhuman and invisible son that uses long tendrils to take over the minds of others. I... I don't know what else to say to that. It's a thing. Before we get to the weird, powerful, scary forces of the universe that would probably melt your brain if you ever perceived them in their entirety, let's talk about the guy Arthur ate. Michael Faust was a, as the wiki describes it, probably human entity left in the same prison pit as John and Arthur. It turned out that he had killed the last cellmate he had though, so the powerful pair teamed up to beat him to the punch. Don't worry, they used the rest of him to avoid starving to death, and even used his sharpened femur to escape in the end. He would probably be a footnote like all the others if it weren't for his name, because no reference to Johann Georg Faust and his fictionalized pop culture form that direct is unintentional. Also, did I mention that they ate him? Of course I have to mention the cannibalism. It's finally time to talk about the Great Old Ones. If you have even a passing knowledge of Lovecraft's body of work or anything in the Cthulhu mythos, this term is probably pretty familiar to you. But for those of you who aren't, the Great Old Ones are a bit like gods, but more physical and alien and able to make your brain do a good impression of soft pudding. They're beings beyond human comprehension, the most famous of which is of course Cthulhu, who isn't actually in this story yet, so he doesn't matter. 
So instead, let's talk about the three, or maybe five depending on how you want to slice it, entities that fall under this category in Malevolent. The first makes its appearance as early as episode one, and that is Shubnigurath, or the Black Goat of the Wood. Within the mythology of Lovecraft and the world of Malevolent, the Black Goat is seen as a maternal deity of fertility, birthing many nightmarish dark young. We do actually get a good description of it from Armitage's book, and... Oh. Oh god. Well, let me put it this way. It's about what would happen if you combined the aftermath of the Ohio chemical spill last month with a tentacle-loving anime fan's wettest nightmare. I particularly dislike the use of the word festers here. Well, anyways, it's about what you expect out of an eldritch abomination. In 1924, there was an attempt to use a ritual to capture the mother to us all, but it didn't exactly go to plan, instead ensnaring a chunk of the king in yellow. That's about where it ends for Shubnigurath's involvement in the series, but don't worry, because now we get to talk about the professional little chaos gremlin, and also maybe Jesus Christ himself, Cain. As the most insane spectator in a Rusty Quill property since Jonah Magnus, Cain definitely gives the vibe of being so immensely ancient and powerful that to anger it would essentially be a death sentence. Fortunately for our protagonists, the manic god seems to smile upon them, acting almost as an audience for all the nonsense going on. Mostly, his involvement seems to be out of a need for entertainment, given that he murders an entire city just because Arthur and John took too long to get there, and he got bored. He can make items appear and disappear at will, he can freeze time, shift consciousnesses of other godlike beings around, and live out other people's lives. Basically, he can do whatever he wants. I know I jokingly mentioned that he might be Jesus, but I think that if they revealed it to be true and not just some out-of-pocket remark, I wouldn't even be surprised. Maybe he's the devil. Maybe he's Nyarlathotep. Maybe he's us, the audience. Or maybe he's just some guy who got bored on a slow Tuesday and decided to become God. We just don't know. And that's almost scarier. This brings us on, finally, to the King in Yellow. The King in Yellow is a frequent staple of Lovecraft's mythos, but he didn't actually create it. Rather, The King in Yellow comes from one of H.P. Lovecraft's biggest inspirations, Robert W. Chambers. Yes, I did read an entire article on how he was inspired by that one story and how it played into his works just for that one line. No, it wasn't a waste of time. Why do you ask? Anyways, yes, the King in Yellow is a very powerful figure, most often tied to a particular symbol called the Yellow Sign. Oh, would you look at that? There it is, right on the back of Arthur's hand in this wiki picture. That's another check in the correct tally, I suppose. Right now, the King in Yellow of Malevolent is shattered, and some of his pieces have found their way out into the world at large. Most notably, we have John Doe who has taken the standard stand-in name for most English-speaking countries, the United States included. John gains a great deal of humanity as the story goes on, or at least seems to, as his conversation with Kane may indicate, which even puts him in opposition to the rest of the King in Yellow. For a while, John gets forcibly sent back to the King, and a fragment of him is taken by Kane and given to Arthur, which he nicknames Yellow. This decidedly more aggressive piece of the king wishes to be reunited with him, but, as we see later in the series, appears to have jumped to Wallace Larson when the Golden Boy returned. Also something I'm sure won't be important going forwards whatsoever. <sighs> so, apparently... We still have to do items. We are on page 9 of this script, and I still have to do items. Okay, how about a compromise? I'll cover the important items, and skip over the boring stuff. Trust me, neither of us need to hear in-depth descriptions of the three separate guns Arthur has had because of the fact that he can't keep hold of any of them. Starting out, we have the lighter, which has the words This too shall pass carved into it. Also, it seems that even powerful beings, like Cain and Yellow, are unable to locate or acknowledge the lighter, 
which is probably important. You know, if I had a nickel for every time a Rusty Quill Horror podcast I've talked about on this channel has had a main character directly linked to the idea of eyes keep hold of a mysterious lighter with an engraving revealing some key trauma of their backstory that they seem incredibly skilled at keeping a hold of, I'd have two nickels, which isn't even enough to buy the payoff of this joke. There is, as I mentioned already, a typewriter made out of a crow that just messages the black goat comes. That's probably important. There is a lantern that keeps dangerous beings at bay and glows with green flames, not to be confused with the guide lantern from the Dreamlands, which shows correct pathways. There's a tooth taken from the head Kellen used to own which now acts as a vessel for a vanguard, allowing John and Arthur to ask the powerful being of the Dark World inhabiting it different questions. There is a pallid mask, like those worn by the cult, which makes certain things visible. There is a crystallizer of dreams, which is basically just a fancy rock, and the glass of lime, which is basically just a magic window. Arthur gets the cane summoning coin from the spirits of three old knights, which he later uses to save his life. John uses a set of fishing hooks they acquired from the stranded ship to stitch up Arthur after a close call with the invisible creature, giving them the mysterious tendril as well. There's Selenine, which could have given Arthur control of his body again if it hadn't been destroyed, a peculiar root vegetable he traded away, and a dagger gifted by Cain and used against himself in the encounter with the King in Yellow. After taking it from Larson's office, Arthur can use a magical flute to impose some degree of control over the creature in the mines, eventually killing it with the flute's aid. He also has an Order of the Fallen Star Medallion, a powerful black stone that many are seeking, and is gearing up to acquire a Freemason signet ring from his former father-in-law. I think that's everything important, which should mean that we are done with this video. I don't know how much more writing my brain could take tonight. Alright, well, that brings us to the end of this exploration of the worlds of Malevolent. I know that this video has been a bit more disorganized than the others, and I am sorry for that. But Malevolent is a very media-dense series, so it took a lot of time to get all of this ready. I have to say I'm excited to see where the series goes from here, and what creative new directions it might take. Regardless of what they are, I'm along for the ride, and I hope that this video has, in part, convinced at least one of you to start that journey. It's certainly less of a commitment than TMA. Thank you so much for watching, and one more time, if you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing to show your support to the channel. It's a very low amount of effort, but it really means a lot. Anyways, I've been Afton G. Keir, and good night, YouTube people.